I think we, we uh, have heard three extremely rich um, presentations, and there are some points I would uh, like to um, reflect upon. First of all, if I were to um, arrange my shopping list about the types of globalization that we have seen discussed, um, I would make a distinction between uh, trade globalization. Trade globalization um, raises aggregate income, but not equitably. It um, um, uh, leads to less equality uh, between countries, but not within countries. Um, financial globalization, which um, has been destabilizing to a significant extent, and is also uh, to blame for a considerable rise of inequality. Technological innovation and information communication technology flaws, which uh, tend to cause dislocations uh, in the labor market. I'll come back to that. And finally, migration, which is a version of globalization, which of course of offers opportunity for uh, welfare improvement uh, for people coming from the poorer countries, but tends to undercut uh, the low-skilled uh, incomes, the low-skilled um, workers in developed economies. So this, this would be my summary. And of course, globalization is um, an, ex an exogenous force, in a way, uh, observed from the standpoint of any developed country, but it is also endogenous in the sense that any, especially developed countries, especially developed blocks, have a very significant impact in uh, um, defining the terms of globalization. Now, uh, that said, if I were again to summarize, going back to um, the Milanovic elephant that uh, uh, Dr. Mario Banerjee uh, presented us, I would say that we have a clear uh, improvement, as you said, at the back of the elephant, and the trunk of the elephant, but not the beginning of the trunk of the elephant, which is the, um, uh, the, the poorer or the sort of uh, lower middle class um, uh, people or, or the low skilled in developed countries. Um, and this um, could take us to two types of sort of statements about inequality. And, and one is a strong statement about inequality, which if I were to uh, borrow the late uh, Atkinson's phrase, I would say, he said it does matter if some people can buy tickets for space travel while others are queuing for food banks, uh, he said. And um, uh, at least it matters politically. And if you can ensure that no people are queuing for food stamps, then it might be worth um, not having any people afford to buy space tickets. Now, this would be a strong statement about inequality, and it's certainly not one that is shared across the board, which takes me um, to the weaker statement about equality, which tends to be much more broadly accepted, and which is the basis for the sort of a cross-party, cross-ideological consensus, uh, which is that we have to uh, place our emphasis on eliminating poverty. We have to uh, focus especially on what happens at the bottom of the income scale. Um, rather than the overall distribution of income or the general extent of inequality. Um, now, I have a few things to say with, with regard to that, and I'll, I'll try to point them out um, in the following moments. Um, first of all, with regard to trade globalization, um, it is generally accepted to be a good thing, uh, and I'll come to the caveat on that. And there is a fallacy in expecting that you can revert to protectionism in order to correct for the dislocation that is caused by trade globalization. Uh, and it is a, a fallacy because of the degree of integration of today's economies. So when, uh, when Trump says that we need to support Boeing because it's an American company, um, he either forgets or he pretends to forget that Boeing um, is part of a globalized supply chain and, and most of the parts that it uses are imported from all over the world. And it cannot be broken. And this model cannot be broken down without major upheaval, which will end up costing jobs and incomes, and not necessarily of the wealthiest or the better off. So to promise protectionism as a response to dislocation created by trade is a fallacy, and perhaps even more so, it's a fraud. Now, the main thing I would like to, to point out is that Europe has had an historical experience on how to deal with trade integration. The, the, the model espoused by Europe in the post-war decades has been one combining trade liberalization or the single market with the, an active role of welfare states in cushioning the losers 
of globalization and, and trade liberalization. So if I could summarize it, it's sort of Adam Smith abroad, Keynes at home. Uh, and this has worked pretty well for the entire post-war period. Um, the job of trade liberalization was done by the European Union or was done at a global level. And the job of cushioning the losers or the worst of the weakest ones were, was done by the national member states. So this is the division of labor that, if, whether we like it or not, is, is the only game in town. Uh, the, the international, the global level cannot compensate the losers. This is the job of the national welfare states to do so. And some countries do that better than others. Um, the Scandinavians uh, have done much better in terms of inclusive growth. Um, the Singap Singapore has done much better in terms of inclusive growth. Other countries have not. Other countries have uh, tolerated very high levels of inequality and very high levels of poverty. And in the Milanovic uh, uh, book, there is a very elegant graph that has four quarters, which shows one axis is inequality, the other axis is sort of poverty, and you see there are countries that are faring uh, badly on both. Um, now, of course, having said that, I am not blind to the fact that modern European welfare states are severely constrained. And they are constrained, they're under stress, um, for demographic reasons, because of aging, as was mentioned by Dr. Banerjee. Uh, far too many baby boomers retiring already, um, and also for tax reasons of tax competition, which is, comes together with globalization. Um, the ability of capital to move across borders tends to uh, lead to lower tax rates um, and shrinking tax revenues, or tends to shift the tax burden to less mobile, to more immobile factors of production. Uh, which is more sort of economically rational, but it comes as a, at a political cost, at the social political cost, because it means higher taxes for consumers, uh, for um, uh, real estate, and, and so forth, or for property, and so forth. So it hurts politically. Now, in, I may, let me make a parenthesis here, because it would be uh, interesting to see what happens in Europe, as I've spoken about the European model. Inequality has fallen in Europe between 1994 and 2008, but it has increased very significantly after the crisis. Um, the poverty rate has risen post-2008. Um, and uh, instead of a target of eliminating poverty in Europe uh, by about 20 million, which was the Agenda 2020 target, we now instead have an increase uh, by about 6 million, 6.7 million in Europe as a result of the crisis. And of course, this is not spread equally because there are economies that are doing much better than others uh, that are being most severely exposed to the crisis uh, through high levels of unemployment and inability of welfare states to play this role of cushioning the losers and the worse off. Uh, and this is, by the way, one of the most severe problems in terms of the sustainability of, of uh, the European uh, model uh, through this crisis and what it means for the social politics of the particular member states where the crisis is more intense. Now, what to do? Uh, and I'm not going to say anything path-breaking on that, but the first thing is that since we are talking about globalization as a force of dislocation, um, deter a kind of global race to the bottom. Uh, regulate, uh, govern, govern globalization by way of upholding environmental standards, health standards, labor standards globally. Um, allow markets to be flexible, to be compatible with globalization, to be able to allocate resources across sectors, across firms, but also to compensate, have states that compensate the losers to extend safety nets. So this, what has been summarized as a model of flex security, I know it's 290s, but or to also to 20th century uh, for our taste, but this is the best uh, recipe that we have. Active labor market policies to retrain workers that lose jobs, etc. Go after tax havens. Um, go after tax havens. You can only do that at the global level. Uh, no government is powerful enough to do it alone. Not even the European Union is powerful enough to do it alone. Uh, you need global level cooperation. And it is, I think, quite a misfortune that on the other side of the Atlantic, there is an administration that does not seem to understand what the problem is. And its logic is very far away from uh, the logic of global international financial uh, collaboration. Um, regulate the financial sector. It's been mentioned already by, uh, by Professor Yanitsis. Um, and by way of uh, social policies, do what many of things have been, have been said, uh, uh, focus attention on the early stages, at the early stage of education, preschool, etc. Now, that said, the scope, and I think we should keep that in mind as a, as a note of caution, that the scope for improvement in education is lower. 
uh, in his lore because secondary education is already universal in developed countries and because higher education is very widespread. So the, the premium of education, which was hailed in the 90s as a very important element in improving opportunities for the worse off, uh, it now seems to be decreasing. And it's decreasing more in Europe than in the US. Now, this brings me to technology, which has mentioned, has been mentioned already. And of course, um, technology uh, uh, kills jobs, but also creates jobs. And from the time of Ricardo, uh, Ricardo, in fact, in the 19th century, uh, uh, was envisaging a case where machines would be destroying jobs. And this is part of the creative destruction of, of <laughs> capitalism. Um, sort of armies of tailors have been replaced by sewing machines, typists by, by PCs. We have all that in mind. Yet, um, we have to keep into account that there are more jobs being lost to technology than to globalization of trade. Uh, and also that today's ICT, information communication technology, 3D printing, robotization, etc., are far less labor intensive than the major technological breakthroughs that we have had any time in the further past, such as steam engine, railways, electricity, sanitation, or whatever. And this creates a concern, and, and this concern has to do with the status of the middle class. The middle class is what has been the backbone in developed, advanced capitalist democracies, um, and they are under strain. They are under strain because it used to be, uh, until the 90s, I would say, that the the less skilled were losing to the better skilled. So education would be the ticket or the passport to 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 be able to to have a better life. Um, now we see. Um, many medium, medium skill jobs being lost as a result of, of technology. Um, and we, we see a, an increasingly polarized market between the high end, the high end, high skills, and the low end. Um, and the, the medium, sort of medium skill jobs are, are uh, suffering to, um, to offshoring and to uh, technology. So we have a shift which is also, was also referred to by Dr. Banerjee, um, sort of from what we used to have from low skilled to high skilled. Um, a shift of resources. Now we have a shift from labor to capital because capital is cheap. It's cheaper than labor in some cases. Uh, and this undermines the middle class. And this is probably the most important political challenge for developed uh, economies. It is not so much, it is not only those who are left behind. It's not only the weakest and the worst off. It is also the middle class who see their incomes being stagnant, do not understand why. And uh, part of it is part of this process that I've described. But of course, the greatest responsibility of it is what national governments do. And in most countries where the problem is very acute and where inequality is an acute problem, governments have not been doing enough. It is not accidental that we have, we have had the most uh, aggressive versions of populism and demagogy and anti-status quo politics in the US and the UK. Uh, these were the countries that have tolerated high inequalities uh, for the last decades. And they have done so by uh, allowing um, a very um, a kind of a tax policy and welfare policy mix that that um, leads to that effect. And then, of course, uh, the European Union is scapegoated, and uh, liberalism is scapegoated, and the mainstream party system is scapegoated, and people vote crazy. But the root cause of that is the failure, not of globalization, but of national governments to be able to cushion uh, the losers of that. Uh, finally, final point. Secular stagnation. Um, it is not just a matter of distributing or redistributing. It's just a matter of decreasing inequality. Um, advanced economies are faced with a very um, um, bleak prospect uh, if the prospect is one of secular stagnation, of poor economic performance uh, for the visible future. Uh, and there are considerable arguments to be taken into account that point to that direction. Lower productivity growth. Uh, in developed economies, a rise of savings as more and more people retire. Some people have suggested that we have to boost global demand, uh, increase the labor pool, but the already labor pool is already um, um, cannot give much more given the high rates of participation of women in the labor pool already. Uh, so this points to more immigration. Immigration must have to be part of the growth policy mix in the European uh, countries at least, or developed countries. And of course, after the experience of the great crisis, we cannot uh, uh, allow ourselves to rely much on financial uh, liberalization or um, people solving or boosting their um, prosperity by, uh, by sort of uh, 
building by um, expanding the levels of private borrowing, consumer credit, mortgage credit. We've seen where that takes us, the bubbles that become uh, terrible busts. So this sort of um, 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 lukewarm uh, conclusion is where I would like to point to. There are significant opportunities in globalization, but there's a lot of responsibility that falls upon national governments, and they need to work better on increasing cohesion within national societies. Thank you.